So the title of the sermon, if we could just put that up on the slides, is The Battle is Won. And I want us to focus in on the victory that we have in Jesus. That's really what this sermon is about. But I want to start by setting the context of where we're at right now. I don't know what kind of a week each of you had. Hopefully you've had good weeks. I know students, you're just getting into classes and getting settled and all of that. I hope you had a great week. But I know that for some of us, probably, it's been a week of challenges as well. And if we look at our world, I'd like to look at the, the week that we've had here in our world, um, because it feels to me like we're kind of reeling in the boxing ring from blow after blow if we look around at the things that are happening right now. So Hurricane Ida pummeled the Gulf Coast and then New England in ways that wasn't even fully expected. There are fires burning across California. There was the recent earthquake in Haiti that I think has kind of drifted in the back of our minds now because of all the other things that have happened. Of course, we have the ongoing COVID pandemic and all the fallout of that. Students, you lost a whole year at college. Um, some of us have lost loved ones. Some of us have lost jobs. Some of us have lost relationships through this time of COVID. Almost every day there's news reports, even locally, um, of abuses and scandals. There's violence, there's robberies, there's the war in Afghanistan. And I did a little Google search as I was putting this message together. Not sure if you're aware, but there are 70 nations right now, a third of the globe, that are at war or in conflicts right now. That was as of August 25th, 70 nations. Again, in the U.S., sometimes we feel disconnected from all of that, and we forget that. It gets very comfortable here. But all of these things are happening, and Pastor Ellen and I were talking about what's been happening in local places. Some of our neighboring communities are struggling in different ways, and she said it's as if the evil is just rising up to the surface, being exposed. And I think that there's some truth in that. And I don't want this to be a downer. There really is a hopeful message in all of this. But I'm trying to set the context of the time that we are living in. This is our reality right now. Near the end of his life on earth, Jesus warned us about these very things. And I want to have a look at this scripture from Matthew chapter 24, verses 6 to 8. It sounds like he was talking about today. He says, you will hear of rumors, of wars and rumors of wars. But see to it that you are not alarmed. See to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in various places. All these are the beginning of the birth pains. So most of those things that I just listed, those are happening somewhere else. There's a war in Afghanistan. There was a hurricane in the Gulf. For us this past week, Steve and I, we heard of two instances of a friend of a friend who passed away from COVID. But what happens when these trials come closer to home? What happens when we take a direct hit, when it becomes personal? How do we respond? What happens when war breaks out in our country and our family and our friends are affected? What happens when a family or family member or a friend or even ourselves, what if we get COVID? What if we lose our job or even miss out on a year of college? What if we're cut off from seeing our loved ones for months on end or maybe for years? Or when the people that we trust turn on us or, or hurt us, what happens then? Because often when these things happen, we're shocked. Like we're taken by surprise or maybe even offended that something bad happened in our lives. Like we're like, no, this can't happen. Why me? Why would the enemy target me? Why would a bad thing happen to me? When it gets real, we often groan and we complain and, and we, you know, make it personal and we say, God, why weren't you there to protect me? Where are you? We talk a lot as people of faith about the fact that we have an enemy. And we even sing songs, as we did this morning, about being in a battle. But think about it for a moment. There's no soldier who goes out into battle without first counting the cost and knowing that there's a possibility that they're going to take a bullet. Okay? 
We have to be aware of the possibility. And Jesus warned us, like he knew these things would happen and he warned us and yet he said, don't be alarmed. Amazing, right? That he would say that these things will happen, but don't be alarmed. He warned us that these are what he said were birth pains, that these must happen before the end would come. But often as people of faith, we get kind of double-minded with that, okay? I mean, we've heard Jesus's teachings and we know that there's this glorious climax coming. We sang about it again today. We know that there's victory in this battle. We know that, that all things are gonna come to a, a conclusion. Jesus promised not only that he'd conquered sin and death, but he promised he would come again and bring his kingdom with him, right? He promised that he would defeat sin and death forever and ever and ever. And that, you know, we would see this glorious day come together. And we all want that. I don't know about you, but I dream about that. Like, I want to see the second coming of Jesus. The Bible says that he is going to come on clouds from heaven with power in his glory, and he's going to bring angels with him, and he's going to gather all of us who believe in him all together to be with him. Don't you want that? Like, don't you want to see that happen? I really want to see that happen. But, but here in these verses, Jesus says that there, have to, there has to be birth pains first. That before that glorious thing happens, these things have to take place. And we don't, we don't want the these things. We just, we want the glorious returning. And, and I agree with that. I get that. I was on Instagram yesterday and I saw a picture of a good friend of ours named Kat who lives in Taiwan and is just this close to delivering her first baby. She's all pregnant and round and just like ready to pop, they say. Um, she's so obviously pregnant she's, and she's bursting with excitement. Her post on Instagram was just all about how she cannot wait to meet her baby daughter and to hold her. She and her husband, John, have been waiting for months for this baby girl. There's this promise that they have that they haven't received yet and they're this close to it happening. So when labor starts for Kat, she is going to welcome those birth pains because she's going to know that it's happening. Okay, but from experience, I'll tell you, when she's in the middle of labor, she's probably not gonna be so happy about it, okay? But she's still gonna know that those birth pains are necessary to accomplish what she's waiting for. Can you hear that today? We don't fully understand why, but we're gonna take Jesus at his word because he's, he's shown his truth throughout our life and experience. The birth pains are necessary so that we can receive the thing that we're waiting for, okay? Once their baby daughter arrives for Kat and John, they are gonna be able to say, it was worth it. I know that from a fact. My husband Steve and I have five kids. I'm really experienced with birth pains, okay? But I can say with every single one of them, with no exception, it was worth it. It was worth it. But I'll be honest, I found, <laughs> my daughter Abby's here, she was worth it. I found, however, with my very first experience of labor, and I'm not gonna get into gory, gruesome labor and delivery stories, don't worry, but the biggest problem that I had with that labor was my mindset. You see, I was falsely idealistic that I could just pray really, really hard and I was gonna sail through this labor without any pain. And it didn't happen that way. And I was shocked and I was mentally and emotionally unprepared for what I had to go through. And it was really, really tough because my mindset wasn't focused in the right way. I was actually really, I felt abandoned by God in that moment because he didn't take the pain away the way that I thought he should or I thought he would. And it was hard. We're living through birth pain days right now. And I don't know how you feel about that, but I want you to know that God chose you particularly for such a time as this. He puts you on earth in this time, in this place, with your experiences for a reason, for a purpose, for his divine purposes. He hasn't taken his eyes off you. He hasn't forgotten you. And he hasn't expected you to suffer in ways that he is not willing to back you up on. 
okay? But he hasn't promised necessarily to rescue us out of them. And that's the thing we have to get hold of. But he has promised to be with us through them. There's a difference. A lot of times we want God just, just make it all go away. He says, no, I'm not going to do that, but I'll be right alongside of you through it all. Over and over and over again, we have this promise from God. I will be with you. And I forgot I was going to put a picture up there of a pregnant woman for expectancy for that scenario, but we're going to move on to the next slide. God says, I will be with you over and over again. If you search it in scripture, you will find so many times when God repeats these same words. Isaiah 41 verse 10, fear not for I am with you. Be not dismayed for I am your God. Deuteronomy 31 verse 8, it is the Lord who goes before you. He will be with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. Do not fear or be dismayed. Do you see a theme here? Matthew 28 verse 30, right as Jesus is ascending back to heaven, behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Over and over again, this is God's promise to us. And I learned through the next four birth experiences that I went through with my children that God was with me through the birth pains, even if he didn't save me completely from them. And the thing is, and this is the thing that really needs to sink in for each and every one of us. Please hear this. We are in a battle. Whether we want to be or not, whether we feel like we signed up for it or not, we're in a battle. Sometimes we forget that fact, especially I'm going to I'm going to just own this living in the US being an American. We forget this sometimes we can be very comfortable. We can want things to be easy. And we forget that there's a battle that is raging. It's not just a little skirmish. And I'm not just talking about we have personal battles for sure. We have battles against temptation. We have battles with ideologies with where our friends line up on things where our family you know, things for our family believes that doesn't agree with where we're at. Like we have a lot of personal battles for sure. But we are right in the middle of the cosmic battle of the ages. The one and only really the battle that counts. We're smack in the middle of that. And that's every single person. I don't know where a lot of you are at with your relationship with God. If you've given your hearts to Jesus, but whether you're a believer or not, you're still in this battle. Whether you have faith in God and you've set yourself apart as a child of God, or whether you're a person without faith, you still have an enemy because every single person is made in the image and likeness of God. And every single person is the delight and the desire of God's heart. And by virtue of that, we have an enemy who hates us. Satan hates all people because of those characteristics that we carry. So we have to have an understanding the battle is universal and it affects everybody, everybody. And when I talk about the fact that there's a battle and I want us to absorb that and recognize that, what I want us to be careful of is that we do not take on a victim mentality. We shouldn't take on a victim complex about the fact that there's a battle. The way that we fall into a victim complex is when we make it personal. Why is the enemy attacking me? Why do bad things always happen to me? Why am I always struggling in this way? When we start to get into that mindset and we take it personally, like we're the only one who's being targeted, then we come onto this victim mentality and we forget that we're actually victors in Jesus Christ. My husband Steve and I, we gather once a week on a Thursday via Zoom with a group of apostolic leaders that are global. Most of them are in the US, but we have, we have some from other, other parts of the world. And over the past few months, we've been growing in our relationship as a group. Now these are all leaders. They're all leading ministries. They're all doing amazing things for God in different places. Um, Steve and I kind of pinch each other, you know, pinch ourselves every once in a while. We're like, what are we doing here? Because <laughs> these people are like, wow, world changers. But we've been sharing our testimonies 
together every week for the past, past several months. And there is this theme through all of our testimonies that honestly has really taught me something. Every single one of us, no matter who we are, no matter how strategic, influential, powerful we are, every single one of us has a story of suffering, of brokenness, of battle. Every single one of us, every person on this planet has had things to overcome. Every single one of us. If we can get past the fact that it's not personal, it will actually strengthen us to be able to move forward. Okay, when we think it's personal, that undermines us. But it's not. It is the universal human experience at this point in history. It won't be forever. But if we've been in church for a while, or if we've read the Bible, we know, and we sang it today, that's not the end of the story. That's not the end of the story. We know the end of the story. Read the end of Revelation, and you will be so excited. The good side wins, okay? We can just declare that right now. That victory is already secured. Amen, right? Amen. God and his angels, they defeat Satan and the powers of darkness forever. That victory was sealed by Jesus when he defeated sin and death with his death and resurrection. We would probably agree we haven't seen the fullness of this victory yet though, right? There is a perfect time when it will all come to pass. And scripture tells us, listen to this, there will be a new heaven and a new earth. God will dwell among us in a way that is tangible. We will be his people, he will be our God, he will wipe every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain, for the old order of things will pass away. You'll find that in Revelation chapter 21. Satan and all those who have served him will be defeated, thrown into the lake of burning sulfur and tormented forever and ever. Revelation chapter 20. The dominion of Jesus will be an everlasting dominion. It will never pass away. It will never be challenged for again. He'll never have to fight for it again. It will be his everlasting dominion. The kingdom will never be destroyed. Daniel 7, verse 14. And those who are victorious, us, the victors, not the victims, will inherit all of this and will live forever as God's children. Revelation 21. This means that all who believe in Jesus, who put their faith in him as their savior, who acknowledge him as God, are going to partake in this victory forever and ever and ever. That's all of us. That's all of you. We get to be in the victory parade. We get to, to push all these things behind us that we battled through and see that it was all worth it. Instead of being victims, we are victors. And so I encourage us, don't lose sight of this. The battle already belongs to God. That's not in question. But for reasons we don't fully comprehend, the story is still being played out, right? It's still, we're living in the middle of it. It's the now and not yet. It's a tension that we live with. And so we need to have the right mindset as we go through our days. We really need to have a heavenly perspective in the middle of all of this because I'll be honest, these days are really evil. And these days are very confusing. It's really easy to become overwhelmed, especially if you ever read the news at all. And sometimes I just try and stay away from it because it's a lot. We need to pay very, very close attention to what the Spirit of God is saying in these days. And we have to be informed by God, not by the news, not by our friends, not by our teachers, not by your own opinions, not by your own fears. We have to be informed by God. And so I want to look at the next part of this passage in Matthew 24 that Jesus spoke about. But as I turn to this, okay, I'm just going to encourage you, get your victor mentality on because you're going to need it for the next place we're going. But it's important that we go there, okay? Remember, these are the words of Jesus. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death. 
and you will be hated by all nations because of me. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. I think we're seeing some of that right now. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Now, I know this passage is really heavy, and I like, you know, even giving it to you, I'm like, oh, I don't even want to say that. I don't even want to bring that out. But these are the words of Jesus, and it's important that we look at them. And I want to wrestle together with this passage just for a moment, because I really think there's some gold in here that we need to dig out. Somehow, as Jesus is sharing this, and remember, he's speaking to his closest friends. He's speaking to his closest friends. This doesn't seem to bother him. He's telling them this, but he's not like coddling them or, or in fear for them, right? And this is the same Jesus. He, he prayed about these friends. He prayed about these followers in John 17. He said to God, to Father God, he said, while I was with them, I protected them and I kept them safe. None of them has been lost except the one doomed to destruction, who is Judas. Jesus obviously cared really deeply about this group of people. And now he's telling them they're going to be persecuted and put to death. And he doesn't throw himself between them and the danger. And he doesn't give them an escape plan. And he could have done those things, right? He could have come to them and say, hey, when I resurrect from the dead, I'm going to come, I'm going to rescue you, and I'm going to just take you right away to heaven with me. I honestly always thought that was the way it should work. Like you put your faith in Jesus, and you just get this automatic get out of jail free card, and you get whisked away to heaven. Wouldn't that be so much easier? Like everybody would come to Christ, right? <laughs> it would be glorious. I love it. But it doesn't work that way. God sees things differently. There's something in his perspective on life that we have to trust, that we have to press in for, that we have to have some understanding of. Somehow, we have to go through the birth pains. And so in Matthew 24, Jesus warned his friends and through them, all of us ahead of time, that things were going to get sticky. And he gave us two pieces of advice that seem contrary to what we're being told. Wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes, famines, persecution, death. Don't be alarmed. Don't be alarmed. I feel almost foolish standing up here and saying that. Don't be alarmed. Stand firm in your faith. I've been told, I didn't count them or fully do the research on it, but I've been told fear not or don't be afraid is mentioned in the Bible 365 times, one for every day of the year. Why do you think God went to such effort to repeat that over and over and over again in scripture? Because he knew we were going to need the encouragement, okay? He knew what we were going to face. He knew what we would be up against personally, individually, and also corporately, just as the human race. And he said, don't fear. His word goes before us. He says, I know that there's a battle. I don't want you to be afraid. It's really counterintuitive, isn't it? But I have to believe that given God's perspective, what he knows that we do not, somehow he's willing to allow us and even to trust us to go through the fire and know it will all be worth it in the end. As I was preparing this sermon, I was prompted to look up a really familiar Bible passage, and that's Proverbs 3, verse 5. It says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. It's one of those Bible verses that, like, you find it on bookmarks and, and stickers for your water bottle and embroidered on cushions or hanging on walls. It's, it's one of those verses, right? It's just one of those iconic Bible verses that we find everywhere. We, we share it with each other when, you know, our life takes a twist or a turn that we don't understand or we don't like. But listen to those words afresh in the context of the birth pains. 
in the face of persecution and even death, God says, trust in me with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. That shouldn't just be something we have embroidered on a cushion. We should like fashion that into a, a, a really strong shield that we hold over our hearts so that our hearts don't get discouraged, so we don't get dismayed, so we don't get overwhelmed, so we don't lose heart. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Why would he tell us that? Unless he knew that there would be a need that we would have to trust him. All of a sudden, it's not just a, a, you know, a cheerful platitude. It's a deep spiritual truth. We need to know how to trust in him. Why would he instruct us not to lean on our own understanding unless he knew that things would be confusing and our interpretation maybe wouldn't help us? We need to pay really deep and really close attention to the things that the Spirit of God is saying, especially in these days. I want to finish with a quick look at a soldier who went into battle, a soldier that God called into battle, and that would be Joshua. A lot of us are familiar with the story of Joshua. God called him to lead the nation of Israel into the land that God had promised him. And in order for them to receive this land, they had to go into battle against the people who were living in that land. He was chosen by God to take over from Moses. God loved Joshua a lot. Like he really esteemed him. He handpicked him. His favor was with him. He thought very highly of Joshua. And despite all of that, God sent him into battle. I want you to know God thinks very highly of you. He loves you. He delights in you. He's still going to send you into battle. It's the way it goes. It's the way it goes for all of us. But God had already promised Joshua victory, the same as us. The same as us. Yet, Joshua still had to face battle, the same as us. God knew that he was sending Joshua up against some really formidable enemies, some really strong armies. And he must have known that Joshua's faith would be challenged. Because what did God say to Joshua? He said, I will be with you. We've heard that already. I will never leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. The promise is there. It will happen. Be strong and very courageous. And then... Again, in chapter 9 of the same, verse 9 of the same chapter, he says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God be, will be with you wherever you go. I think God knew that Joshua was going to be afraid. He repeated it again and again and again to make sure that he really heard the message. I think he was telling Joshua, you're going to be stepping into some scary situations here. You need to hear my heart for you. You know, the fact that they were entering the promised land was so scary that a whole generation of Israelites turned from God's promises and ran back into the desert because they were so afraid. Actually, God kept them from going into the promised land because they weren't ready for it. It really wasn't, you know, we read it through the pages of Scripture. And we're like, yeah, God promised them the land. Yeah, God gave them the land. It was easy. It wasn't easy. They had to go into battle for it. But God promised to go with them. And he told them not to be afraid. Be strong and courageous. I really believe the Lord is saying the same thing to each one of us. I really do. He says, I will always be with you. Be strong. Be courageous. Do not be alarmed. Do not be afraid. Stand firm in your faith. For the battle is mine, says the Lord, and I already have the victory. 
Amen. The battles that we're facing are all different. The battle that I'm facing right now in this day is I'm battling to understand how my brothers and sisters in Christ, other believers, can have such very different perspectives on what's happening, different understandings, and can allow divisiveness to happen within the church. I'm battling to understand that. For you, you might be battling other concerns. You might be battling health concerns, something physical. You might be battling fear. For the students, it may be a battle with your coursework. It may be a battle with your schedule. Maybe it didn't land the way that you had hoped, and it's, it's actually a challenge, right? You may have a battle with some of your peers. We might have battles with financial needs, battles with criticism, battles with failure. Maybe we're battling with a relationship. But we all are facing battles on different levels in different ways. And all of those battles are important. They're important to us. They're important to God. And he is with us in them. But the greatest battle of this day, I believe, the greatest battle for now is the battle for our faith. It's the battle for our trust in God in the face of all opposition. The battle is for God's reputation and our relationship with him. And I'm going to share more about that next week. But the battle is for God's reputation and for our relationship with him. We really need to trust God with all of our heart and lean not on our own understanding of things. Joshua went on to win battles. The battles that God was with him in, he won those battles, hands down. I think there were battles that he had, I know there were battles he had, where they had no losses. You can't even conceive of that. That's miraculous. And after one such victory in Joshua 10, he praised God. And then he declared to the people that were around him, to the other, other Israelites, he said to them, be strong and courageous. What had been spoken to him, he like absorbed it and became his battle cry, so much so that he could tell other people and encourage other people to be strong and courageous as well. He passed it on. He proved God through it and he shared it with the people around him and he built them up in their faith. And I want to challenge us to do the same. Let's not just survive the battle. Like, let's not just get through by the skin of our teeth, okay? And like, whew, okay, I made it. Matthew 24, that passage I read to you, it ends, and the gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. I pray that each of us are going to have testimonies in our lives of God's goodness, his faithfulness, and his victory, and that we'll be able to share them with others. We can tell other people, yep, it is really challenging now. Like, let's be honest, it really is. But God has told me, do not be alarmed. He said, be strong and courageous. He said that he was with me. So I have faith in him and in his victory, and now I say the same to you. If you think that being a believer in Jesus is hard in these days, imagine for a moment what it would feel like to be faced with famines and earthquakes and wars and all the things that are swirling around us, hurricanes and fires and plagues, all of it, if you didn't have hope in Christ that there was victory through this. What would it be like as an unbeliever right now trying to face these days? The people around us need what we have. They need that sh full assurance of faith that we walk with. They need to know that there's a reason in all of this and that there's an end that is glorious. We have that. We have what they need. And so I encourage each of us, if you have faith in Jesus, share it every chance he gives you. And if you don't yet have faith in Jesus, because I don't know where we're all at in this room, you need to know 
that he's everything that you need in these days. You, everything you need to get through this life, plus the guarantee of life forever with him in heaven. Ask the person that you came with, ask one of us pastors, and we will help you know how to choose Jesus as your God and as your Savior so you too can enjoy this victory. So finally, I want to share three survival tactics for the battle. These are actually three survival positions where we need to be. We need to be in the Word. We need to be reading God's Word not just reading it, meditating on it, digesting it, letting it become part of us, listening to it, praying it through, just letting it fill us. Everything that I shared today of encouragement and of just interpretation of the times we're in is all from God's word. He's spoken to all of it. We'll find such strength, such hope, such encouragement if we take time to be in his word. We also need to be in God's presence. It's actually hard to read God's word without his presence. I don't know if you've ever read the word when you're tired or when you're not really engaged and it, you're, you, know, you can go back a couple chapters and not remember what you read. It can be really hard to get through. It doesn't have life on it. But with the presence of God, we get to read a book with the author sitting right next to us, helping us to understand what he meant, helping us to receive it for ourselves. We need to welcome the presence of God into our lives and into our days and into our moments. He wants to walk alongside of us. He wants us to partner with him in everything. The Spirit of God is a gift to us. He comes alongside of us to comfort us, to strengthen us, to lead us into all truth, to empower us. Everything that we need, we find in him. His presence in our lives will ignite a fire within us that will burn so strong that it'll empower us to face any battle. So be in the word, be in the presence. And lastly, we need to be in community. We need to be in community with people of faith. I'm so glad that you all came today. Some of you are new to us. Welcome. We're so glad you're here. Come again. Come be part of this community. Find communities on campus. Find communities in our, in our community, you know, out there in the city. We need to stand with each other and build each other up. We need to pray for each other and encourage each other. It's not always easy. We really do need each other. Sometimes we lose sight of the goal. Sometimes we forget about the victory. We need other people to help us hang in there. It's not easy. So we need to be in community. If we're out on our own, it's too easy for us to get isolated, get discouraged. And again, if you're in battle and you're on your own, the enemy can pick us off so easily. So be in the word, be in his presence, be in community. The days are evil and the battle is hard, let's be honest. But the battle is won and our God is victorious. And we get to share in his victory if we continue on in faith. So we're gonna go back to our table groups just for a few minutes, and we have one more discussion question. Just share around your table groups for a moment. What is a battle that you are currently facing? What is a challenge that you are currently bringing before the Lord? Some of you prayed at the beginning of the service about anxiety you were feeling. What is that? What is that battle that you are having to stand up against right now? And then take a few moments to pray for one another.